So we have our last lecture today. And um, we will uh, talk about uh, ancient solutions to the two-dimensional Ricci flow. <coughs> and at the very end, I will tell you a little bit uh, about ancient solutions to the 3D Ricci flow, but uh, nothing too much. And I heard from Robin that you had a nice introduction on the Ricci flow uh, yesterday for the students that they don't know that. Uh, we have some students and that they are experts on that. And um, so, uh, OK. So I don't think we need this. Uh, oh. oh, OK. All right, let's see, because uh, there is a little problem. OK. OK. All right, it, there is a little delay, but that's OK. All right, so. Um, so as I said, uh, maybe yesterday, uh, we, the, our original problem, the original problem that we wanted to solve uh, is to understand the uh, ancient solutions, can compact solutions, of the three-dimensional Ricci flow. And we soon realized that that was so hard, so we started from the beginning, which was the curve shortening flow that I described yesterday. So then we said, OK, we cannot do the 3D, but let's do the two-dimensional Ricci flow. And as you learned yesterday, because in the two-dimensional Ricci flow, there is a conformal invariance, and you can write the equation as a, um, you can write the flow as a nice uh, uh, quasi-linear diffusion equation, things are not so bad. Um, and uh, so what I will describe today then is um, the 2D Ricci flow, but let me give uh, a brief introduction about the Ricci flow uh, in general, just what, a couple of slices and uh, uh, some of the results. So what is the Ricci flow is, as uh, you learned, I think, yesterday, is the evolution of a metric GIJ which we put on a Riemannian manifold um, in general of n dimensions. Um, and it's the evolution of this metric by minus the Ricci curvature. OK? And as we say, that this is an intrinsic geometric flow. And Richard Hamilton, uh, my colleague and collaborator, whom I met actually here at the Institute for Advanced Study when I was postdoc, and um, introduced this Ricci flow in 1981 uh, as a um, PDE tool, or a geometric tool, but I would say even a PD, to approach a topological problem, which is a very old conjecture, the Poincaré conjecture, which says that every simply, uh, simply connected closed 3D manifold is homeomorphic to the three-dimensional sphere. So the idea is that when you evolve this metric in a nice way, so you don't change the topology, eventually you end up with a singularity uh, after rescaling, etc., and after many difficulties, which is just the uh, uh, is uh, it has the same topology as uh, the spheres, more or less, and. Uh, and um, that's it. OK, that's very easy to say. There is a long way to go. First of all, this Ricci flow, it's a, um, as you heard in some of the talks, it's a complicated system of equations. Singularities may occur. You have to try to understand the singularities. And as we say, perform surgery, you don't need to know, to go around the singularities, deal with this, etc. So to be able to reach to that point, you need to understand the singularities. Because if you don't understand the singularities, there's not, you cannot uh, somehow bypass them and reach to your topological problem. Okay? And so <coughs> that was the vision of Richard Hamilton when he started. And nobody believed him. Everybody, in analysts and topologists, said, OK, he's crazy. And, but he said, all right, I will try it. I will be persistent. And um, 
in the meantime, then that's a good example for all of us, I think. You know, it's nice to have a long-term vision and struggle hard, but it's good also to be a little bit pragmatic and see if, like, with this long vision that we have, in the meantime, we make steps where we prove some good theorems. So that's what Hamilton did. Uh, he started working on this flow, starting from short time existence, also the Turk the kicked in, etc. cetera. And, uh, um, and then in the meantime, he established many important results on the Ricci flow. And so and, uh, he did the two dimension on Ricci flow, et cetera. And, uh, Many people worked on that, uh, if I start discussing it in the meantime, not just him. And uh, as uh, in about 2002, 2003, actually Perlman, I think the same year Hamilton was here at the Institute for Man Study, uh, uh, somebody said, oh, uh, there is this uh, very good Russian mathematician, Perlman, he was a postdoc, but then talked to, uh, talk to him, said to Richard Hamilton, maybe he had some uh, you know, intuition himself. He was very young, Perlman. So Hamilton started talking to Perlman, and it took Perlman a long way. Uh, but uh, at 2002 and 2003, came with some breakthrough work. Uh, introducing some new ideas based on Hamilton's work, and finally he resolved the Poincaré conjecture. All right, so so which follows actually from the combination of the work of Hamilton and Perlman and other mathematicians. Okay, so this is the story, and of course uh, the significance uh, of this is uh, uh, that's an example of how you mix tools in mathematics. For example, here you mixed PD and geometric tools to solve a topological problem. And it can happen any way around, right? OK. All right, so that's enough. Uh, and uh, uh, OK, I, I will skip that. So as I said, the idea is to analyze the singularities. And as we said last time, analyzing the singularities means that we focus to a singularity, and after blowing up, you end up with ancient solutions. And the work, both of Hamilton, but especially of Perlman, deals a lot with ancient solutions. OK? I don't want to get too much into detail. OK, so by the way, in, the, in this work uh, of Perlman, um, Perleman raised the following question, what are the ancient solutions of the 3D Ricci flow? And he introduced actually a notion of non-collapsing, which is hard to explain, but uh, somehow uh, if you visualize a flow, let's say mean curvature flow, which is an extrinsic flow, non-collapsing means that uh, you, don't, um, you, you don't have a solution that as n approaches min minus infinity for mean curvature flow, for example, looks like a pancake, which means collapses with an infinite diameter. This means, or a crepe that we had yesterday, right? Very thin, is, uh, but the crepe is too thin. Pancake. <laughs> <laughs> a pancake where you have two planes collapsing, right, in zero curvature, but in the other, when you go around the pancake, right, you have some, you, have, you still have a manifold with the distance, right? And so this is somehow a collapsed uh, manifold, right? And uh, so a pancake is a collapsed manifold. A sphere is non-collapsed because somehow there is a uniform, um, uh, the curvature at each point is related with the diameter somehow, right? So, so Perleman, in Perleman's work, what is very important, this uh, kappa non-collapse condition, as we say, non condition, plays a important role in the classification of singularities and dealing with the flow. And apparently, he's able to show that on the singularities that he wants to bypass and study, things are non-collapsed. Therefore, he's mostly interested in studying these non-collapsed things, all right? which have better properties. And he's asking us, um, what are the ancient solutions of the 3D Ricci flow which are non-collapsed? And if you know this, then you can is mo more easily understand the singularities. Okay? And so this was our original problem, uh, which we started uh, around 2010. And we made small steps. And finally, I think we now can do. Okay. 
Now, if we go 1D, of course, a three-dimensional Ricci flow, a two-dimensional, a solution of the two-dimensional Ricci flow, it's also a solution of the three-dimensional Ricci flow, because you can take a 2D solution and cross it with a line, take a sphere, cross it with a line, right? It becomes a cylinder, it becomes from 2D to 3D. Okay, of course, it's not that this, when you cross, a compact solution with a line, right? So, which means consider the product of the solution with the line. You make you end up with a non-compact solution. But these solutions also play important role in understanding the three D. So, what I'm saying in two D solution, it's part. Okay, it's uh, uh, understanding the two D is important into understanding the three D because you take manifold again you can somehow cross it you, you consider the product of this manifold with a line you end up with a three a three-dimensional manifold and this play a very important role actually in the classification okay so that's enough and for that so okay so we started, so what I would like to talk today is about ancient compact solutions to the 2D Ricci flow Okay, so the nice thing that you have learned yesterday is in 2D, all the information about the curvature, the Ricci curvature, is given by the scalar curvature, and this, which is more or less uh, the sum, uh, the trace of the Ricci curvature. And, uh, and so, in the sense that, uh, I'm supposed to point out, that the Ricci curvature, oh, where is this? <gasps> okay. He really wants to go to the first page. I'm going backwards in time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, that's what he wants to do. All right, definitely. Okay. <laughs> all right. So all the information. So what in, in 2D, Rij, which is the Ricci curvature, is one half the scalar curvature multiplied by the metric. So you end up with a nice PD. I'm going to write it in a second. But uh, let me just tell you what maybe you heard yesterday. So um, uh, Hamilton, this is, you see one of his first results uh, in 1988, and Ben Chow in 1991 studied the 2D Ricci flow. So they like the evolution, let's say you consider S2, S2 is your manifold, and you can consider S2 with a standard metric that you took yesterday, but you can put on S2 any other metric. All right? What is a metric? It's a way of measuring distances between two points. You can measure distance the regular way, okay, from uh, uh, which uh, like uh, inherited by S2 as a manifold, or you can put any other way you want as long as obey some, some rules, okay? All right, so um, Hamilton and Chow show that you put any, suppose that you take S2 and you put any metric and you let it, let it evolve by the Ricci flow, the flow is kind of nice and eventually, at a finite time, the metric will evolve, will develop a singularity in the sense that the curvature will blow up. It's like the sphere shrinking, right? The distance is becoming smaller, curvature becomes big. But after rescaling, you see the metric of constant scalar curvature, right? Therefore, you see the sphere. Okay? So this is somehow an idea of what's happening in the 3D Ricci flow, of course, here it's idea because nothing else happens, right? In the 3D, th a lot of other things happen which we're trying to bypass with lots of tricks. Okay? Very good. All right, now we have to move this. Okay. So, as you learned yesterday, in um, uh, the Ricci flow on S2, um, uh, can be written in a very nice way, okay? Why? Because we said R is the scalar curvature, which is more or less the Ricci curvature, and uh, the scalar curvature in uh, 2D, right, uh, can be written in terms of the conformal factor U. So before of the, because of the uniformization theorem, which you learned uh, yesterday, you can take the metric G, 
on a stool, let's say any metric, and write it as a conformal factor multiplied by the standard metric. This we know what it is, and u is just a function on S2. Okay? And then the Ricci curvature, sorry, the um, uh, the Ricci flow becomes equivalent with this nice, okay, it's not so nice because it has the log, but it's pretty nice. It's as we say for me, it's beautiful because I st started studying this long ago as I was a student uh, on, uh, on R2, on N in general. Uh, these are called porous medium type of equations. So you end up with this equation, the UDT equals Laplacian, so this is the Laplacian of S2, log of U minus 2. And therefore, as, and this is kind of similar nature for what we studied uh, on the curve shortening flow, because on the curve shortening flow, remember we had the theta. What does theta mean? Theta is like S1, right? Theta is like going around the circle, right? Okay, here instead of going around the circle, we go around the sphere, all right? And Okay, and um, so we have two, of course you have a matrix, you have a 2D case, but that's why you know, curve shortening flow and extrinsic flow, etc. But you see, this is almost like the two dimensional analog of what we studied yesterday. Okay? All right. So let me write this equation. So the Ricci flow on S2, so this is U sub t, is our metric, is U, the standard metric on S2. And our metric u is Laplacian on S2 log of u minus 2. Now I want to write something else because I'm going to use. You may, I don't know if you talked about it yesterday. Now, um, let me just do a little picture. Now, most of you have seen what is a stereographic projection from S2 to R2. Okay, so what it is, you pick, let's say you have your North Pole here, and you take the South Pole. So you identify R2 with a sphere minus a point. Minus a point is this point, so we're going to take this point away. Okay, and then you take any other point, you take the North Pole, and you join these two points and you project down and you hit a point and this you correspond to this point uh, P, this point X on R2. And this you can do it for any entity. So this is the so-called stereographic projection. So you can map, there is a one-to-one -one map and there is a formula for that, you can Google it. Uh, from S2 minus a point, because this point is not mapped to anything, it's mapped to infinity, to R2. So if you have a metric on S2, you can transform it to a metric on R2. Now these two are not exactly equivalent, because if you want your metric on S2 to be smooth, okay, here you have taken a point away. So you need a condition at infinity, your metric, you need to satisfy a condition at infinity so that it's one-to-one -one correspondence. But nevertheless, every time I'm doing my Ricci flow, I can do this stereographic projection and I consider my u by metric G, which was US2, as a U bar now, the Euclidean metric. What is the Euclidean metric? The x, x squared plus dy squared. Okay? And then U bar, the Ricci flow, this two goes away if you write. And now the Ricci flow becomes becomes equivalent with my favorite equation. Okay, this is not exactly my favorite because I like working on Rn more than S2. <laughs> okay, I'm joking. But although must say S2 is compact, so it has its privileges. And but so these two are almost the same equation. They are kind of equivalent, apart from the fact that this point here is mapped to infinity. 
So this, guy, this, this equation may have a lot of different solutions where you, uh, when you map up, uh, just give me a moment, to S2, you create a singularity at a point. But nevertheless, these two equations are equivalent, and we will be using this equation too, because sometimes working in these variables are, uh, uh, are, um, is easier. So if I call S this stereograph, oh no, S is not a good uh, P, this stereographic projection, then U bar, this is little p, this is capital P, okay, then U bar, at x comma t is equal to u right uh, to u p inverse at x comma t right? that's how i define u bar right because i can go the other way right this is p and this is p inverse this is p the, my projection <laughs> and this is p inverse so I can define for any point x, I can map it on the sphere, okay, and vice versa. So this is the correspondent. Now, your question. So old school and magic. There is just a small technical comment. I think the north pole is what goes to infinity, right? right. The north pole, the north the pole the that disappears. The south pole goes to the origin. Unless you're building it up. Ah, yes, 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 sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. So this is right, but uh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> okay, this is the one, yes. This goes to the origin. Sorry. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, so this is the, my North Pole. I, I haven't switched. I haven't, I haven't done the Earth. I haven't turned the Earth <laughs> <laughs> upside down. Okay, <laughs> I'm just joking. And so, anyway, so yes, yeah, so this is the only point we cannot map, right? So, thank you, thank you. So this is a, so P. Okay, all right. We know you know what I mean. All right, very well. <laughs> okay, all right. Now let's go back to the 2D, so this was, we will be using this in a second, but let's go back. So our problem is to understand ancient compact solutions to the 2D Ricci flow, which corresponds to, an, to metrics that we can put on, on S2, and they are ancient, which means that they define all the way from minus infinity, and they're solutions of this nice, simple equation, okay? All right. Now, uh, of course, one is the spheres, right? Again, so, it's a, so you already have a sphere, which is your background metric. So you consider just a change, right, which reflects to just a Ricci flow. So, that con so this U uh, visualizes so a metric on the sphere, right, which evolves by the Ricci flow. It's just U is a function of T. The only thing you change is you say, okay, instead of taking the usual distance, I'm taking the usual distance on the sphere, adjusted by a function of t, so that it evolves by the Ricci flow. So the first solution is just solutions that depend on time. And so if you look at just at the PDE, here you can consider solutions that they only depend on time. So there are solutions of the O D D U D T equals minus U. What are these? This is minus T, minus two T. Alright? Okay. And now, but here are the friends I was taking I was talking yesterday. There are these other solutions <coughs> that uh, uh, they look uh, like uh, like this as we talked uh, yesterday. So there is a um, um, Something that uh, this cigar, so let me show you. And so part of this solution now it's the rotation is symmetric, and you may say, okay, but these are not extrinsic. But how this is how what the metric does, okay? The metric, right? What does this mean having a solution which are op is oblong like this? You can still view it as a solution on the as a metric on the sphere, but what it means when I go from here to here, I the, my distance becomes too large. From here to here, around this way, my distance still uh, is uh, comparable to the yes. How are cigars related to angular ovals? 
Um, yeah, it's just an analog of the anginate ovals. So it's exactly the analog of the anginate oval. They're not related in the sense that you have two different equations, but they are exactly the analog. And not only that, they are like a, they are very much like the analog in the sense, okay, in the sense that they are both, as we say, type 2 ancient solutions, and they're both collapsed actually. Solutions, by the way, ah, it's an example of collapsed, uh, of uh, according to Perelman solutions. But anyway, I don't want to, not non-collapse, collapse. But I don't want to, to, uh, to, to, to tell so, you so much information confusion. But let me just understand the solutions because it's important in the way we capture them. So half of the, part of this solution is, it's this which is a non-compact solution, and we call them the cigars. Right? So the Ricci flow has also some non-compact solutions. Their rotation is symmetric, is 2D now. And one side from this side are compact. And here is the maximum curvature at the tip. And this side extends like a cylinder. And back then, you know, people were smoking more than now. <laughs> and so <laughs> they were calling them the cigars, right? I think Hamilton uh, called them the cigar. OK, so you have a cigar here, and a cigar here, and a cylinder in the middle. And the cigar, as we talked yesterday, they are, don't change. They are solutions of the Ricci flow. They are in the only dependence on time is just plus something, so it's almost. So it's just they move by just um, translation. They just translate. They don't change, OK? All right, so again, how do we visualize a cigar here, a cigar there, and a cylinder here? OK, so these solutions, um, OK. Now, these solutions, actually, these are solutions to the Ricci flow were discovered by John King much before the Ricci flow became popular. John King is an applied mathematician uh, who worked on this equation. He worked on diffusion equations on, R, on Rn. <coughs> okay? So for, this is a well-known diffusion equation on Rn. People were interested. It appears also in applications. So King, right? worked on spe special solutions for this equation. And he discovered the solutions that I just uh, uh, described, the so-called uh, King solutions. <coughs> right? This is how they look as when you visualize them as metric on S2. But on R2, on our they just, uh, I will tell you what they are. That's how he, uh, how he found them. All right? So in these equations, this class of equations is a general class. This is a general. Uh, there is a general class of, of equations that this equation be belongs to, and these are called fast diffusion and porous medium type of equations. So you have du dt equals Laplacian of u to the m, where m is can be any exponent. And somehow, m equals 0 corresponds to log of u. Because you can write log as u to the m minus 1 over m, right? And the limit as m approaches 0. So I don't want to get into details. But so this somehow corresponds, this corresponds to m equals 0. Uh, because you can write the log as u to the m, right? Calculus minus 1 over m. You take the limit as m approaches 0. OK, so in some respect. So anyway, so and King was studying special solutions of these equations, OK? In particular of the log of u. Now, why I said this? Because these equations come from physics. And for m bigger than 1, at least, is the so-called porous medium equation. I talk about this. And there is a physical many, there is a physical uh, quantity, which is u to the m minus 1, which is called the pressure, as we talked uh, yesterday, too. And uh, so I'm going to erase that. So in these equations, uh, u to the m minus 1, u bar, OK, is the pressure. 
which kind of has a nicer equation, as we say, but physically means the pressure of a gas through a porous medium. That's how it goes. And in our case, where m equals 0, right, the pressure V bar is U bar inverse. So what King, King, it's always nicer. I'm going to write in a second the equation of the pressure. But oh, maybe, but uh, so King looked, uh, so King <coughs> looked for special solutions of the, um, um, of uh, looked for special solutions of u bar sub t is Laplacian of log of u bar on r2 times, OK, I don't think he was looking for ancient solutions, but this uh, happened to be ancient solutions, OK, which are rotationally symmetric as a function on r2, and which look so, so, that acts, so that u bar, the pressure, which is v bar, this is a function of x and t. Right? V bar, which is U bar inverse, the pressure is a function of X and T. And it's, he looked, so rotation is symmetric, so it depends only on mod X. And in terms of this mod X variable, radial variable, it's just a polynomial, right, in R. But because you want something that is smooth when X equals 0, you want to go only the, odd, the even powers, x squared, x to the fourth. Because if I put an absolute value, mod x, I'm making not smooth. Right? So he was looking for solutions of the form, let me follow, 2b. OK, in general, OK. Uh, but what he really looked are from solutions uh, in this form, plus, etc. Because well, that's what applied mathematicians do when they're trying to find special solutions. You look for power series solutions. Okay? And since you want the power in terms of the radial variable, and since you want the solution to be smooth, you cannot have the even power, the odd powers of R. Okay? So, okay, so then he plug back, you have a power series. I'm oh, sorry, this is T. You plug back to the equation, and you find is a system of ODEs which defines your coefficients. And then he said, hmm, for this particular case, I can close the solution. So I can find one that is not really a power series, but it has only uh, three, um, three uh, like uh, it's only of degree at most four. OK? So it is of this form. OK? And now, there are two cases. So he, and actually he observed by just solving the OD that if A is here, A is here. And OK, it's related to A through, the OD, through an ODE that comes if you, you can just try to do it yourself, right? Uh, say that you're a king and look for polynomial solutions, convince yourself. So anyway, so he found out this solution. Now, A and B are given the relations between B is given by an ODE. And now, if A equals to B, this means that you can complete the square here. That's why I wrote it to B. So you write it as A of t in the case where A equals to B. So here is A, right? So if A equals to B, then V bar of x and t is A of t 1 plus mod x square square. All right? Now, this is not the metric. This is the inverse of the metric. The metric is u bar of x and t, our metric, which is 1 over this. For some a of t. OK? And for some of you that uh, uh, you have seen uh, this uh, conformal, uh, how you write the conformal factor on S2. This corresponds to the spheres. So if you tell, if you want, right, if you write the spheres via stereographic projection, right, this is what you get. 
Okay? So this corresponds to the solutions of the spheres. And otherwise, okay, you end up with, uh, if B is different than A, then you solve the ODE and you find some other coefficients. I don't really care what the coefficients are for the purposes of what we are going to do. The quest, the, but the thing is that because A and B, the coefficients are such, so that as T approaches minus infinity, you see that as T approaches minus infinity, the only thing that survives is the B, the A goes to zero. So what happens as T approaches minus infinity, V bar here for the King solutions, as t approaches minus infinity, you have a sub t um, a sub t goes to zero, and there and b sub t goes to some constants, but I think even one. I don't know. Uh, maybe some. Uh, anyway, b sub t goes to a constant, to a constant mu or something. Is it mu? Uh, because it's cotangent, right? S is uh, whatever to some constant c of mu, whatever mu over two, I think, or something. So then, um, and um, some constant. And so what it means is that at minus infinity, the metric converges, which is u inverse, to something that looks like one over x square, and that corresponds to the cylinder. Because you see, as you uh, look, uh, um, as you when you visualize your solution here, here, as t approaches minus infinity, this part moves to the left, and that part moves to the right. So if you're sitting in the middle and you do convergence on compact sets, you just see uh, the cylinder. Okay. All right. Okay. So that's the story. So that's how King found these solutions, which are actually are written in explicit form. And you're going to see that uh, from um, our proof uses exactly the explicit form of, uh, of the King solutions. All right? OK. OK. Uh, so I told you about that. I told you about that. I keep going up. So, our uh, result, uh, joint result with Hamilton and Sesum, and that was about uh, uh, 2012, okay, back then, uh, is that any ancient solution to the Ricci flow on S2 is either a contractive sphere or the King solution. These are the only two solutions. And actually, it turns out that in this result, you don't need to make uh, any assumption kappa non-collapsed or collapsed, because actually those solutions are collapsed. That's only for the experts. For the students that they don't want to know what is collapsed, that's fine. OK, this other time. OK, all right. So this is the theorem. OK, so we need, OK, I have uh, 20 minutes. I don't think we need more, because I don't want to get into details, to show you how you would go about, right? Having an an ancient solution right an ancient solution of this equation on S2, which is corresponds to the Ricci flow, okay, and so a solution, and saying that okay, either U is constant in space. Therefore, it's just a function of time corresponding to the spheres, or is one of these King solutions. Okay, so this is the theorem. The statement is very simple. Okay, the proof is not so. The, okay, we started from what we knew from the curve shortening flow. Okay, what did we know? What was very successful for the curve shortening flow to use this functional, this Lyapunov functional, all right, this energy, which was decreasing and play around. Okay, we did use this function, so that's what we started, and then soon realized that okay, this is much harder and it's many tools. And this is an example of um, 
um, of a theorem, I think, even this even more so than any other dimension, uh, like even 3D, where we used a lot, we borrowed, so we kept going between geometry and uh, PDE to solve it. Okay, so I wanted to use PDE techniques uh, totally, but we could not. Sometimes we needed the help from geometry. So we were going back and visualizing the, the flow as a geometric flow, getting some intuition from there, and then going back to the PDE. Okay, so these are some of the tools that we use. The Lyapunov of function, I'm going to tell you exactly how we use it. And then uh, uh, maximum principle, isoparametric inequalities, etc. Okay, you don't need to know about this, it's confusing. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but just to show you that it's like sometimes in our work we need to mix and match together different uh, things. That's the only thing. Okay, now, uh, so the first part, the first part of the proof goes very similarly to what we did for curve shortening flow. Okay, what did we do for curve shortening flow? You consider the equation for the pressure. What is the pressure? The conformal factor multiplied uh, 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 u inverse. So v is u inverse. u solves this, and v solves this PD. Okay, so let me write it down so we have it. So I don't think we need any more the King solution. So let's write our PDE. So V equals U inverse by definition, and V sub T is V Laplacian of V minus one half nab V square. Is it one half? I keep forgetting because no, no, it doesn't have the one half because in this T plus two V square. Okay, now let me show you something which we need. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you, talk, you talked uh, about yesterday in this, in the, um, the scalar curvature R, R is the scalar curvature, That's how you, the flow is defined, right? How did we define yesterday the flow? You wanted to evolve by scalar curvature. And the scalar curvature R is given by minus u sub t over u, right? Because that comes, uh, this is equivalent to saying, I mean, that's, that's how you started, because it's Ricci flow. And then, because the scalar curvature in terms of the conformal factor, it's given by Laplacian of log of u minus 2, minus Laplacian of log of u minus 2 over u, that's why you end up with this equation. So if you have a conformal, right, so the scalar curvature actually is minus Laplacian on S2 log of u minus 2. So that's the scalar curvature. But because it's Ricci flow, then you have minus u2 over u, but u is v inverse. So this is the same as v sub t over v. So this v sub t is nothing else than our scalar curvature multiplied by v. So and this will play a role. First of all, we know that on an ancient solution, the scalar curvature is always positive. Very good. That whole follows from the Harnack inequality, which is equivalent to, so, uh, as we say, the aronson benilan inequality. So you can either do Harnack inequality for the Ricci flow, but that's harder. Uh, for, but there is a beautiful inequality that works for all these diffusion equations. It's called the aronson benilan inequality. And in terms of V, it tells you that if you have an equation starting at T naught, not an ancient solution, at T naught, V sub T is bigger than or equal than minus V T minus T naught, T bigger than T naught. This is very similar to what we did yesterday for P. P sub t, it was the same thing. Now, this works for, uh, uh, for the flow starting at t naught. 
but I can start at any on an ancient solution, I can start at any T naught very close to minus infinity. Okay, so this so, so if I have my ancient solution, this is satisfied for every T naught all the way to minus infinity. So if I let T naught here goes to minus infinity, this disappears because I know that V is bounded all the way, so therefore V sub T is bigger than or equal to zero. And then the strong maximum principle, if you don't know about the strong maximum principle, don't worry, it tells you actually that V has to be strictly positive. V sub T has to be strictly positive. Okay, so V sub T over V is, V is also positive, V is always a positive, it's a conformal factor, inverse of color. So this is always uh, positive. Therefore, R is positive. Okay, so we will be using that. All right. Okay. Okay. That these are just the equations. I haven't said anything. So this is I, I wrote the equation and I said some information that we have, which is very important. Okay. Why is this important? Because you see, if you know that V is increasing, V is non-negative. So you have an increasing function. So which means that right, which is non-negative. This means as t approaches minus infinity, the limit, which is a monotone limit, exists because it's bounded from below, right? It's, it's non-negative. Therefore, I can consider the limit v hat, the point-wise the limit, as t approaches minus infinity of v. Okay? So our proof, the first step in our proof is understanding very well what happens at minus infinity. Okay? This is not uh, as easy as, uh, uh, as what we did um, yesterday, although back then, yesterday, also we proved something at minus infinity. You see, in this ancient solution, minus infinity plays the role of the initial data. All right? Because of you, the initial data happens at minus infinity. Or if, or if you have the heat equation and you start at zero, okay, you, to, to say something about the solution, you need to know something about the initial data. In this case, you need to understand what happens at minus infinity. Okay? And so what we want, we work hard, right? So we want to understand what happens at minus infinity. Okay, very well. We know that we have a limit, and then using a priori estimates, PDE, combined with geometry actually, you can show that this limit is in C1 alpha for every alpha less than 1. But we cannot do better. Anyway, this is not so important. Okay, now we need to find something else. So what we show actually is that the scalar curvature, so the next step is to show that the scalar curvature R goes to zero almost everywhere as R approaches to minus infinity. That's a, this is equivalent to saying that V sub T goes to zero. So the, my next claim is that R hat, which is by definition the limit as t approaches minus infinity of R sub t, becomes zero almost everywhere on S2. Everything is defined on S2. So you have something, right? Because the conformal factor is defined on S2, and R is given as minus Laplacian, etc. Okay? All right. So this is where we are heading. And that will be very similar to what we did yesterday. And I'm not going to say the, too much of the details. Um, um, so uh, remember, we, 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 did, we argued with the I of alpha of t yesterday. And then we said, so we introduce this energy, which is very similar to what we said yesterday, OK, with, with the nabla uh, or uh, del, what I learned, <laughs> v squared <laughs> over v. <laughs> That's what I learned from the <laughs> many other things I learned. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, so it's del v squared over v minus 4v. So this is the suitable Lyapunov function. And using just a very simple calculation and the evolution equation of V, you, you prove that DDT of, uh, of J of T, which is the energy, is minus this, 
and minus that. So you have two terms, this and this. Now, this is not important. We're going to throw it away. But what is important is that this is positive, so with a negative sign is negative. And here we are using that v sub t is positive, that I told you. OK? All right. I'm going to have it in my next slide. So I'm going to repeat again. This is, so we prove this, because we threw away the term, the second term. So we have this. And now we do exactly what we did yesterday with the p, with the alpha. So we, instead of writing this, I can write it that way, right? I can bring it, uh, the thing on the left hand side. And now I'm integrating from minus infinity to a fixed naught. So if I integrate, I pick up j at minus infinity minus of j of t naught. And to show, from a priori estimates, I can show that this is bounded all the way to minus infinity. So th since this indefinite integral is right all the way to minus infinity, it's bounded. And since the integral is non-negative, that gives me that, in an average sense at least, v sub t, the integral of v sub t, has to be going to 0 as t approaches minus infinity which tells me that almost everywhere v sub t goes to 0. And v sub t is related with the scalar curvature. Okay? So the conclusion is that as t approaches minus infinity, of v sub t goes to 0. Actually, uh, v sub t goes to 0, you can show, because you have very good bounds, not almost everywhere, everywhere. R is not going to 0. R is v sub t over v. And that is not going to 0 almost uh, uh, everywhere. Because when you divide by v, v vanishes at some points. OK? All right. So therefore, we know that we can pass to the limit in our equation. Because our equation for v was v sub t equals this. But since v sub t goes to 0, as t approaches minus infinity, you converge to a steady state of this equation. OK? And then, all right, that's where the trouble holds. And forget about this, because uh, we don't even have time to discuss it. So, so now you know, what you know is that v sub t goes to 0. All right? So this and r is v sub t over v. The problem is that v can also go to 0 because v decreases. So it may go to 0 at two points. And actually, what happens actually at the two tips of our solution, v goes to 0. And v going to 0 is bad. Why v goes to 0 is bad? Because v is the coefficient in front from the Laplacian. And we have learned on an elliptic equation, this is an elliptic equation, the coefficient in front of the Laplacian, it's better to be away from 0, because then we can use estimates. But we don't have it. We have it almost everywhere but though. So this gives us some trouble. But it's OK, because geometry will help us. But uh, OK. So I just want to show you now what really happened. So, so here is what we are after. We are after this King solution. So what really happens is the following. right? You know that v sub t goes to 0, and you know that r, which is v sub t over b, goes to 0 almost everywhere right? because of the Lyapunov function. Now, what really happens in reality is that the scalar curvature r hat, which is the limit as t approaches minus infinity of r, which is 0 almost everywhere, what you work hard to show is that it vanishes at at most two points. And, and what really happens is the scalar curvature, the limit, is kind of a bad limit around these points. And because it vanishes, you have concentration of the curvature at these two points. So why you have concentration? How can you see that you have concentration from Gauss-Bonnet theorem? 
The Gauss Bonnet theorem tells you that on a compact 2D surface, the integral of the scalar curvature has to be 8 pi. All right? And now, as t approaches minus infinity, r goes to 0 almost everywhere. So what does this mean? means that the scalar curvature needs to concentrate at some points. Otherwise, there's, if, the, if this limit uh, right, is, if this is a continuous function, this can never happen. And it concentrates at exactly two points. And how do you show that it concentrates at exactly two points? You show that around the tips, somehow, you converge to the cigar. The cigar was right what we are expecting. And but the cigar is a surface which is complete, non-compact. The Gauss bonnet tells us that the integral is 4 pi. OK? And we cannot have three cigars because 4 pi plus 4 pi plus 4 pi gives you 12 pi. So you have to have at most two cigars. So you have to have at most two points of concentration of curvature. And that's the essence, this is very hard. The, that's, OK, you have to, of course, all these logistics, you have to put it. So here's where we use the geometry to say that our N analysis, we use uh, some good estimates, actually. Some uh, other people have proven, uh, Merle and, um, and, uh, and Brazil has proved this estimate. OK, some, some PD estimates and some geometry to show that the curvature, as t approaches minus infinity, concentrates at at most two points. Okay, and knowing that we know enough information, once we know that, we have a pretty good picture of what is going on at minus infinity. What we really find is that as t approaches minus infinity, almost every year you go to the cylinder, in the, like uh, on any compact set, you converge to the cylinder. Okay, you still have to work to, to do it, but it's okay. And you have a two points of concentrated curvature. So this is the information we know. And now the pants line, and we're done, is, OK, fine. You know all this about minus infinity. Now we, we understand the data. How do you recover the, the solutions you're after? We are after the two solutions. <coughs> we are after the spheres, and we are after the king solutions. Now the spheres, OK, do not, in the spheres, you don't have concentration of curvature. In the spheres, the curvature goes to zero globally. Okay? So you have two cases. Either the curvature goes to zero globally, uniformly to zero on us two, and then you recover the spheres, or you have these two points of concentration of curvature, and you have to recover the kink solutions. And here is where we go back Looking at the equation on R2, why? Because on R2, it's easy. The, v, the King solutions are just polynomials in the radial variable. And you really play uh, uh, you a lot of paper and to find out the right quantity. And you find a kind of weird quantity. It's a kind of third order magic quantity in terms of V, which is the pressure Okay, on written of the metric written as a function on R2. So it's V inverse, U inverse, where U satisfies this. Okay, the King, uh, what King did. And you may imagine this, you, you find this quantity, which is no negative, okay, and has the following properties. You use the maximum principle to show that the maximum of this quantity. This is a PD maximum principle. You don't have an integral anymore. The maximum is decreasing. And then, because you know now so well what happens at minus infinity, you prove that the limit of the, the maximum of the maximums of t, right, as t approaches minus infinity is 0. This is the hard part. This is all right. Once you know the quantity, you, you compute. This is hard. Because as t approaches minus infinity, your limit becomes non-compact, right? So you need to show uniform convergence on your whole non-compact manifold to zero of these magic quantities. And now, once you have this, the maximum starts at zero, it's decreasing, it, have, it better remain zero. And once you know that q is zero, you can recover the King solution. That's not a problem. 
And that's the end uh, of the story. <laughs> OK. And I, I'm already out of time. And so when was that? 2012. When is now? 2019. With after after just to tell you the okay the the, the path uh, when we finished with this three two D Ricci flow we wanted to look at the three D Ricci flow and then we discovered that that was too hard why because the Perman solution there is the analog of the King solution in the three D Ricci flow were discovered by Perlman. But they don't give in the ne they don't we don't have an explicit formula for that. So there's no way we can cook up a quantity like this and play around. So we had to define a whole different kind of methods. So we realized, okay, that's too hard. So we went back to the mean curvature flow, which is the higher dimensions in extrinsic flow, the higher G curve shortening flow. And we studied ancient solutions of the n-dimensional Ricci flow. We studied this. It took uh, four years or something, five. And, and afterwards, it seems now that, uh, OK, we're still writing down. But it seems that we finally, after how many years? OK, almost 10 years, we can do the Ricci flow. So I uh, know, OK, maybe we're not so smart. Uh, if they were you, they would do it like that. <laughs> but, uh, all right, or other smarter people. Of course, there will always be some, somebody smarter and quicker than you. But I think what, uh, what we all learn when we do research in math is that, uh, OK, we, we fight with our own resources. And uh, we, uh, you know, we are persistent. And at the end, OK, maybe something will come out. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. And, uh,